Hi, I'm James Eade at the Eade Foundation, and the, today's show is going to be broadcast about Chris Torres's summer camp, and I'm going to do a little lecture, but uh, first I wanted to talk a little bit about me because I like to talk about me, and also about the Eade Foundation. Now, the Eade Foundation was set up to help others um, be able to play chess, join the chess community. So building communities through chess is our elevator pitch to those, and right now, you can see we're pretty much all around the countries, all around the world, in many different countries. So we've been in, in Nicaragua, Colombia, on, on this this continent, this, and then we've gone into Africa, and you can see five different countries. We've gone into Lebanon and Bhutan and Asia. So, you know, our, our reach is great, but um, I really appreciate you helping us help them. Go to eatfoundation.org, and you can... Um, see a donate button there. So if you can make any contribution, great or small, uh, it would be really appreciated. Help us send chess equipment, get communities that cannot afford to get started to build a chess community. Help them get started, build a chess community. And when you're part of a community, you're never alone. So help us get to help them. Um, and there's a, a little bit um, more that I could talk to you about chess, but this is really about... Um, getting people to appreciate chess and learn about chess with the, the um, summer camp of Chris Torres. So I want to bring Chris on. Hi, Chris. Good morning, James. And I'm, gonna, I'm doing great. And I'm going to tell people a little bit about how to uh, find you. And okay. uh, I'm going to change the scroll across the bottom of your screen. And that's one way to find out uh, where you are, right? Yeah, that's the, uh, the main hub for our um, free online summer chess camp that we're doing. Um, if people go to dailychessmusings.com, um, they can click on a free online summer chess camp 2022. Then they'll see one for June, July, August. Click on June, and then click on uh, Monday, and they'll see uh, what we're up to today. And it's uh, still not uh, too late to join. If anybody who is uh, um, just finding out about this right now, uh, yeah, it's it's perfectly fine to join. Um, whenever we have uh, several different uh, skill level skill level groups and a mixture of uh, um, live lessons, as we're going to be doing here in a moment. And how much um, does it cost again, Chris? It's free. It's what? absolutely free. Oh, um, so, so this, what yeah. we're going to do today, though, I think it's going to be on the YouTube, right? You're going to find it by going to YouTube, and that's my foundations. Yeah. The channel yeah. search on YouTube will get you to that. Uh huh. And, and that link is yeah. in the um, in the assignments. Okay. Yeah. Great. And so then then um, they it doesn't cost anything to do that, right? But mm -hmm. do you, I uh, I was wondering about subscribers. Do they have to subscribe, or can they just uh, piggyback off of others, or? Should they subscribe? Because I would love to get more subscribers on my YouTube. Uh, subscribing to Jim's YouTube channel is uh, highly, highly recommended. Okay. It is absolutely free. And uh, Jim has an interesting, um, he, the, the way he interviews um, uh, key figures in the chess community. Um, I've, I've been involved in this community for a quarter century. And many of the people that he's had on, I've never um, met in person. I've only heard about. And after I watch um, any of uh, Jim's videos, I learn more about chess history. Um, but I feel like I've gotten to know somebody. I feel like I've gotten to know somebody important in the, uh, in the chess community. So I highly recommend subscribing. Plus, uh, Jim and I do these uh, special special events every once in a while, um, more than every once in a while, in fact. And uh, so you want to uh, you want to be subscribed, and you also want to turn on that notification bell so you know when Jim's going live, um, because oftentimes when he's going live, it's going to be uh, uh, neat stuff. It's always going to be neat stuff, and you want to know. When, when that happens. Okay. So there's Chris. That's where you find him. And there's me. That's where you find me. And today we're going to do something completely different, though. We're going to uh, go through some of the games that I played. Normally, 
when Chris and I get together, we select a game played by a, a master of the past and we go over and see what lessons can be learned. I'd love to pick, and Chris loves this also, pick games that, that show the transition from one age of chess culture to another. And uh, But this time it's all going to be my games that I play. And we're going to talk about the circumstances of the, of the um, tournaments that I was playing in, the, the rhyme and reason for them, and, uh, and then see if there's anything that we can learn from the games. Yeah, and if you're watching, um, feel free to, I'm going to be keeping an eye on the comments. I keep looking down. Um, that's what I'm doing. Um, so if you have a comment or a question on anything that's happening in these chess games, um, we would love to hear that. It, it adds to the uh, it adds to the lesson. Your question may be the same question many other people have in mind or one that hasn't even occurred to some people. And so it'll be uh, beneficial on uh, uh, on a lot of levels. And don't be shy about asking questions. Yes, as, as Chris said, a lot of people might have the same question, but they're just too shy to say something. Mm -hmm. so you'll be doing a service to others if you ask anything that uh, you want to ask. So um, I'm going to add the, um, this is a tournament game that I played, if I can t take this away, in Hawaii in 1994. Um, and the circumstances for this tournament were interesting. The U.S. Chess Federation had a, um, position of regional vice president for a long time. They've done away with that, but I was the regional vice president for the five Western states. Uh, and, um, you know, California is considered two states by them. So it's like uh, California, two states in California, Nevada, Arizona, and Hawaii. And so for the continental states, I ran an international norm tournament <clears throat> that people could um, get an IM norm. Uh, and uh, so I invited the top, some of the top players that, who did not have yet a title um, to compete in that. But there wasn't anyone in, in Hawaii that I thought that um, would benefit from that. So I ran a FIDE rating tournament. Now FIDE has extended its rating all the way down. But at the time mm -hmm. that I ran this, you had to have a 2200 rating in FIDE to get a FIDE rating. So it was very hard. There were very few people in Hawaii that were FIDE rated, even though there were players of master strength. So I ran this tournament in order to get them ratings. But this guy that I played, Leslie Ao, was the strongest player in Hawaii. So I didn't want to take it easy on him. I wanted to win this particular game. Because the other other players, I, I didn't feel like the need. I wanted to get them ratings. So I would give up a draw here and there. I didn't feel the need to go for the jugular on every every game. But this game, I was, I was really interested in. OK. Um, and playing it as well, well as I could. So if you can move the uh, the couple, first couple moves for me, um, D4 is what I played at the time, knight f6 is so standard. Uh, so I played g3, which was very typical for me. Now, this is the, you know, part of the elements of chess is control of the center, and d4 is the, occupies the d4 square, and the attacks d5 square. So, it's uh, very much involved in controlling the center. The NF6 move attacks the E4 and D5 squares. So very much in controlling the center. But what is G3? It's a wing move. Why would you play something on the wing? You see it attacks F4 and H4, but big deal. It's not, you know, F4 is close to the center, but it's not very important. But the idea is to position the bishop on G2. And on G2, it attacks E4 and D5, which is where the knight is attacking. So it's a, it's what we call a fianchetto. The, the Italian pronunciation is fianchetto. And it's a wing position for the bishop. Instead of classically, you would move it to a bishop to C4 or something like that to, to attack the center. But then it becomes an object of attack often. And so this wing development turned out to be very uh, prominent in the transition from the classical era of chess to the hypermodern and to the Soviet era and, and beyond, and still featured in all modern games today. And so black responds in kind with g6. So bishop g2, bishop g7. So these are the wing developments of the bishop in order to control the center from a distance. 
Now I said, well, you know what you did by, by not taking control of the center, by occupying it at all, you gave me a chance to, to do it, to set up the pawn duel, e4 is what I played. And e4, d4 is the pawn duel in classical chess, black. White is now dominating the center position. It's occupying d4, e4, it's controlling b5, e5. And all those wing plays like that, like Chris is showing, you know, is c5 and f5 as well. So this is a tremendous space advantage according to classical theory. But black is playing according to a theory that says you can occupy the center, but it doesn't mean you control it. And I will attack it and I will weaken it. So d6 is a typical move to do this. And now fights for control over e5. It opens a line for the bishop on c8. So the bishop can come out and play into the game. And so this is um, a great, you know, developing move. <clears throat> It, and it attacks the center and prepares perhaps either e5 or c5. So these types of positions are becoming more and more popular because they're very dynamic. Black has not tipped his hand, his or her hand, yet as to how it's going to choose to proceed. And white has made some commitment to the center. The white's saying, you know what? I'm, I'm doing fine. I'm doing just fine the way I am. And so White proceeds with knight e2. Now, oh. typically in classical chess, you want to put it on f3. That We always say that's a natural position. But on f3, maybe bishop to g4 can pin it, and I can't depose anything. But the, the knight gets out of the way of the king and the rook to ca allow castling. It influences center by controlling, helping to control the d4 square. And... Um, it's just an independent move. It doesn't tip its hand so much as uh, typically you would see by knight f3. And also allows the bishop on g2 to keep support of b4 pawn, which is incredible. You know, knight f3 would allow knight takes b4. So knight e2 is a better option at this point in time. So black says, okay, fine, c6. Now, c6 is also a good move in the sense that it is attacking the center square d5. And it also prepares the wing development of the queen on d8. d8 can come, come to b6 or a5 now, the queen on d8. So the only, the obstacle, uh, the problem, I would say, with c6 is that the knight can't move there anymore. So you've, you've limited the mobility of the knight, and the knight, any piece's power is tied to its mobility. And if you've taken the square away from the knight, you've weakened its power. But maybe it'll come into the game through d7, and it won't matter. You just don't know at this point. So let's continue on. And uh, did, we, did we get a comment? Uh, uh, not yet. Okay. That one makes me lose my these castles of the center before I uh oh amazing. Jim your uh, your audio um uh just uh, went uh, a little uh very digital on us. Did you open a, a new window on your uh, computer or anything? No, I didn't bug uh oh. Yeah, th things are very uh, unintelligible right now. Okay, I'm not sure what happened. That's much better. Okay, you're back. All right, terrific. So, uh, any case, we are, we're done with talking about C6. Now we're talking about castling, right? Castling, because the action in the center is going to open up the game, and you don't want your king in the center when the game opens up. So knight to um, the b knight to d7, and so he says, okay, I, I've taken the uh, I'm taking put my pawn on c6, so then my knight belongs here. So if it belongs there, why not put it there? And so white plays c4. Now typically, I am not one of these people that puts their pawns in uh, in, uh, in the center in this way. I tend to be a flank player, a semi-open player. Uh, but 
this is this set up on white for some reason i just wanted to go for the uh, the jugular i just wanted to win this game so bad that i'm playing a little bit um other than what i normally play but more aggressively than i normally play and so that's the idea behind this is sometimes you just play according to the way you feel and i felt aggressive so i played aggressively castles is play nothing wrong with black's position there's no weaknesses to exploit so what do i do knight b c3 the knight belongs on c3 why not put it there queen c7 again typically good move now h3 i have run up against the possibility of knight g4 being played so often i want to put my bishop on e3 and knight g4 would get in the way of my bishop on, on e3 sorry and so I, I take the um, preparatory move, h3, to take knight g4 away. I have plenty of time. Look at my center. What are you going to do? You know, you can't break it open quickly. So I take my time, play h3, and now he breaks in the center, e5. Okay. So you can see why I play uh, h3 now, because I want to play bishop to e3. Mm -hmm. Bishop to e3, protects the d-pawn. So I'm not going to take there and resolve the tension in the center. But I'm going to bring another defender to d4 and say, OK, we're fighting over the d4 square. And I've got three pieces defending d4. So if you want to take it, go ahead. But he plays b5. Now, I think this is a little question mark. Um, this is a little premature. This is. Um, maybe not an absolute question mark but it's 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 a uh, it's dubious i would say dubious is a good way to describe this because it's, it needed to be prepared with a6 something like that before you strike so i think it's a premature strike but it's well conceived in the sense that the way to attack a center is often on the wing so he wants to be able to break down my center. First, he struck with e5, now b5. So it's well conceived, but ill timed. I played now d takes e5, d takes e5. Okay, because I want to resolve the tension in the center because I think he has given me an edge. d takes e5, characteristic. Now, if he hadn't played b5, I wouldn't have made this exchange because it clarifies the position too much. But he's given me this pawn. Pawn takes, uh, c takes b5. And he recaptures, c takes b5. But I'm saying, hey, look, man, that is a full pawn. I'm taking it. Knight takes b5. Okay, so now he plays queen to b8. Fine. It's okay. He's going to, he's still using his queen to defend. Um, the pawn on e5, and he's also attacking the knight on b5, which if it moves, then the pawn on b2 would be unprotected, subject to capture. And then he could restore material, material equality. And if he restores material equality, then he's got a fine position. Then there is no edge for white. So uh, I protect the knight. I say a5, a4. Um, <clears throat> now, there's a couple of things that are going on here. One is I want to advance that pawn anyway. And I want to, my ex ex advantage is on the queen side, so I want to advance on the queen side. And so it also protects the knight. So great. So now he plays a6 to drive the knight away. I say, fine, okay, knight d6. Yes, yes, you, you've gotten that pawn back, right? Queen takes b2. But have you thought about this enough? Queen takes b2. So where is the queen going to go? I'm going to play queen d3 right now. Because I, I have to maintain uh, protection of the knight on e2. So I play queen d3. And it, it's a little embarrassing that I'm threatening rook f to b1. Where does the queen go? That's a little bit embarrassing. So now I'm taking that pawn back, but I'm giving white several 
or at least a couple moves in return, just to restore material equality, white is going to get a big edge in time. So white had an edge in material, and he's translated it into an edge in time. Now does he, time can be fleeting. Material is usually more lasting, but time can be fleeting. And if you don't take advantage of it right away, it can go away. So, but this is a big threat now, rook b1. So what is he gonna do? He plays queen to b4. And I say fine, but I'm gonna move my rook to b1 anyways. So now I've gotten the queen d3 and with the threat, force the queen to move, I've moved the rook with threat, forcing the queen to move. So now I've gotten a couple of moves. I've got my queen developed, my rook developed, and he's just forced to move his queen. So queen a5, pretty much, pretty much forced. So now what do I do? This was an interesting position for me to be in. Because you notice that the bishop on c8 can't move. It's got nowhere to go. The knight on d7 is blocking it that way, and the only other move is b7. So there's a, it's going to take black a little time to untangle his pieces. So I don't have to rush. So I think, all right, I'll play queen c4. Now, now that you see that rook on f8 can't move either. Oh. So these, by, by kind of like making these pieces um, powerless to move, you've reduced them. Not, they're not just a regular bishop and rook anymore. They're held down to the, where they are, their mobility, has been decreased and a piece's power is tied to its mobility. And you'll notice that you can't really play that knight on d7 away because bishop to b6 would trap the queen. So not wow. only the knight stuck on d7, the bishop is stuck on c8 and the rook is stuck on f8. So he plays queen to d8 now this gives him a chance to move the knight on d7 and maybe move the bishop on c8 but you can see how complicated it is just to develop so i play a5 i don't want to play an a a5 himself and then maybe bishop to a6 getting everything untangled that way so keep that pawn on a6 which is coming up the works for black Wow, that was a you know that that that's one of those moves that is a little move, but just keeps black paralyzed. Yeah, notice the rook on a eight, no moved. Yep, can't move. Bishop on a can't move. They look like they can. Sure. You know? Yeah, it looks, it, it looks like they. It, it, first glance, it looks like they can, and then you you calculate what would happen if, and then you realize that it cannot. Okay. So this is um, more of the boa constrictor tightening its grip on the black position, and white is un under no threat, has nothing to defend. The, the pieces and pawns are are equal, so there's no material advantage here. All it is is an advantage in space, an advantage in time. So white is pushing into black's territory, the knight on d6, the pawn on a5, and is poised to bring in more, the bishop on e3, the rook on e1. So he's well positioned. And the knight on e2 even is so, you know, it's not really in the game now. Well, maybe it can play knight c3, knight a5, knight a b6. You know, who knows? It can come into the game very quickly, knight to c3, knight to d5. Who knows? These kinds of games, are, the white pieces have all sorts of choices of where they want to go, and they have plenty of time to get there, and black pieces are not, are just having a trouble finding a square to move to. So this is a good move by black 
knight to e8 is when you're cramped, you want to trade pieces. So he's saying, please, please, please take knight take c8, please. And I'm saying, no way. I play rook d1. No way I'm giving you that gift. If you want to take my knight, and I'll take back and penetrate with my rook. So I will have another piece deep in your territory, putting pressure on your territory. And you won't like it. But he says, I've barely got nothing better to do. I might as well take it. So he plays knight takes d d6. Rook takes d6. Now, queen e7. Maybe I'm going to get out. You know, I'll threaten the, the rook. Uh, maybe now I can play my, my other rook on f8. Maybe I can play it to d8 or, or something, get in the game that way. Maybe it's possible. Maybe I'm going to be, someday I'm going to be able to play bishop to b7. Now, What if I played rook to c6 now? I'm looking at it again. It's the first time I've looked at it for a long time. Now, doesn't that allow bishop to b7? Well, yes, it does. He plays it. And now rook c7. And gosh golly, it's another problem. The rook has gotten to the seventh rank. Rooks love to be on the seventh rank. It's supported by the queen. It's attacking the bishop on d7. It's attacking the knight on d7. The knight is defended. The bishop is not. And the queen is pinning. Is, the knight is pinned to the queen. So, oh my goodness. Black is still crammed. White is still well developed. And white has improved his squeeze. The squeeze is a little bit tighter than it was. Says, well, maybe I can unravel with rook a to c8. That looks good, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it looks a little, it looks pretty good, right? I can't take rook b7, it'll take my queen. Well, what about rook b8? Uh, b1 right now, sorry. Well, you can take my rook on c7, and I'll recapture queen takes c7. Go ahead, rook a, c, queen takes. Now, where does the bishop go? Gosh, this, this is getting serious now. Because now the knight is pinned to the queen and cannot move. The bishop is attacked twice, cannot be defended. It must move. It has no good move. Because if it moves to, say, to a8 and rook to d1 hits the knight again. It's getting uncomfortable as heck. So, in any case, he plays bishop to c8 to guard the knight. Now you can see he hasn't really changed his position very much from where it was. We've gotten one set of rooks traded, one pair of knights traded. Other than that, you can see the pieces still kind of stumbling all over themselves for black. And the pieces are just quite happy for white. And the boa constrictor has tightened. White owns the C file and the B file. Now white is that white it's at white's leisure to how to develop and how to press further, how to squeeze further. And obviously, the knight on e2 can enter the game now. Knight to c3. Look at that d5 square. Isn't it just crying out for a knight to be put there? And yes, that would be a great square for the knight. So he plays rook to e8. Okay. He's trying to get untangled. Maybe bishop belongs on f8. It, and maybe the queen belongs on f8, but anyways, the rook is a little bit better on e8 than f8, but not really a whole lot better. And knight to d5 comes right in. So queen to a6. I'm sorry, sorry, queen to a3. Sometimes do that by mistake. And I'm thinking, okay, gosh golly, what am I going to do about that? How do I squeeze further? Oh, 
what would you play here? I guess you can see the board, so I shouldn't ask. Hmm. So, but this was a, a very tense position in the game. And I played knight to b6. I knew I had a big advantage. I just wanted to, to uh, take it and um, run with it now rather than try to exploit it later. So he's saying, oh, oh, the knight on b6, I don't want to take it. It's going to take my knight bishop on c8. What am I going to do? Oh, I know. I'll take queen takes a5. I'll pin the knight to the queen. So it can't take knight takes c8. That'll save the day. Well, white says, well, what if I just play queen to c6? Now, knight can't take. So queen takes e on e8, and then takes on b6. It's an overwhelming material advantage. So the knight's pinned. The bishop has no square to move to. It's double attack. Can't be defended again. Holy cow. This is all a function of the spatial advantage and advantage in time. And giving black so few choices in where to move, the peace mobility, black's peace mobility shrank to nearly zero. So the power of its pieces shrank to nearly zero. You can see the bishop is on c8 is back where it started the game. The knight is hardly developed. The rook on e8 is developed, okay, but not really, not to one of the open files. The bc or d file are where the straight movers belong. And white has a, the b file and the c file, and the d files are contested. The bishop on g2 and the bishop on g7 are both just doing their job guarding the e pawns. The bishop on e3 for white can cover both sides of the board. It's extremely well developed. The knight on b6 has penetrated deeply into it. This game is lost for black. And he tries queen a2. It's a desperate move to attack the rook. But the rook just moves to c1. And the black has the same problem as the bishop on c8 is lost. So that was that game. And it was a uh, an uncharacteristically aggressive game on my part. And the reason was, was because I wanted to win that game. That was a beautiful game, Jim. Uh, one thing that I really, really enjoyed was uh, when uh, your opponent played uh, 15 queen takes b2, and they restored uh, material balance at that point. Um, oftentimes, um, I'll even allow my opponent to play a move like queen takes b2 and be up a pawn because the queen is so easily targeted there. Right. Good point. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that's a, a classic kind of poison pawn in so many, so many different uh, openings. It's the queen's knight pawn bringing, you know, when your opponent brings their queen out to take that. But here, your opponent took it. And they aren't even up upon. It it's, was just it, to restore material equality, but it yes. had all the negative drawbacks of a poison pot. It had all the same negative drawbacks. And then right here, I really love this this hidden little threat of bishop b6. It seemed like maybe the queen reached safety, but no. No, it's still it's still in a lot of danger, even on their own side of the board. That was a really nice game. Thank really, you. really nice game. Yeah, um, I really enjoyed it, especially because he was clearly the best player in Hawaii at the time. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so I didn't want him running through the team that we assembled from uh, California. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that, that was a, a fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and um, let's see. Let's see if I can do this without messing things up. Um, let me see here. I'm going to 
Uh, open up a new analysis board, and you can see the new board, right, Jim? Okay, I'll bring it up. I'm going to reply to a comment from Facebook. Okay. And uh, just give me a second. I'm going to say it because no it's problem. somebody I know. And uh, there we go. Okay, so now I'm going to bring up this screen. Now, let's see. Remind me which game we're going over. Because I don't see the players' names. Um, I think. Uh, um, well, I haven't loaded it yet. We were going to look at the uh, Frias game, right? Right. All right. So let me go ahead. Um, Internet's just being. I guess it's on. Uh, yeah. Let me set up this this tournament. There we go. There we go. And let me um, copy it real fast. This tournament was. Uh, the U.S. Amateur Team East, which um, is a great, great tournament. The, the organizer is Steve Doyle, um, who's been doing this for years and years, and I cannot uh, emphasize what a great job he does. And um, it's a fantastic tournament, but one of the best. I like team tournaments because it's not always about you. It's about your team. And uh, so it builds camaraderie, and I like that aspect of it because usually chess is a one-on-one -on -one competition and when you have a team that you're rooting for as well then uh, you know it's no longer just me against you it's uh us against them and it's just it builds so and you know when, when you play another team and you're not playing that person you know you can be friendly with them you know you're because it's more it's not a one-on-one -on -one type of thing it's a and so I, I just love team competitions, and I think this is the best um, for players that are not professionals, yeah, such as myself. But the guy I'm playing in this tournament is Victor Frias, who is an international master, rated around 2,600, um, probably the highest rated player I ever defeated. Um, and Victor was a character. He was a joy to be around. He was full of life and really a funny guy. Uh, funny in the sense that you you just make everyone around him laugh, and uh, you know so you couldn't couldn't be in a bad mood around Victor, and I really liked him. But when when we're sitting down to play, they start the games, and I'm on board one. I'm on board one throughout this tournament, and um, they're they're all there. They're, all the games start except for my opponent. It's not there, and I don't know who it is because it's a team. All I know is the team name. And I'm waiting for the board one, you know, five minutes go by, 10 minutes go by, 15 minutes go by. And then Victor walks in. Of course, I know Victor. I know who he is. And I was thinking, oh, gosh. Oh, I was starting to think he wasn't going to show up. And that, he was just playing with my head. He was just toying with me. And uh, he shows up with a big smile on his face. And we shake hands. And we sit down. And so now, you know, in the last game, I was feeling very aggressive. I was full of votes. And, then, you know. This game, I'm not so much, but I start D4 anyways. <clears throat> this game, I just want to survive. Knight F6, typical. Knight F3. And uh, I'm just trying to survive, you know, play solid. Just want to escape the opening. I don't, you know, <clears throat> Victor's opening preparation is superior to mine. So I just want to play normal, solid moves and get out of the opening. But immediately he plays C5. He's a very aggressive Benoni type position. So I play E3 and I'm just going to say, okay, I'm going to take a little more passive, but I want to play solid and just be solid. So he plays B6. So he's going to take more of a, uh, into maybe a Queen's Indian type format where the bishop is developed on B7. He controls D4, uh, D5 and E4 um, from a distance. The knight on f6 and the bishop on b7 will team up to control those squares. So I play bishop to d7, d3, and um, that that's my attempt to say I'm going to fight for e4. You I know mean, I've got a pretty good hold on d4 now. I'm going to fight for e4. So I'm just going to try to maintain the center positions on my side of the board and not let you occupy or control them, and keep the balance in the position because you know I'm not feeling my oats here against Victor. Bishop to b7, typical follow-up. Knight b, knight to d2. Uh, again, typically what I'm trying to do is not let him control e4. You know, saying I got d4, I'm not letting you get e4. 
and then I'm going to be fine. You can't overwhelm me if I got those two center squares. So uh, he plays e6. So he's got to get his bishop out. He's not going to fianchetto it on the wing, so he's going to make, move it to e7, or maybe he's going to take on d4 and move it someplace else. I don't know yet. He hasn't tipped his hand. But e6 is a fine move. It allows the bishop on f8 to get into the game, and it also prepares d5. If he's going to play that, who knows? Uh, so he hasn't tipped his hand yet. Uh, so um, I castle, which is, you know, again, just standard moves, just get my king to safety, uh, just trying to be balanced. Bishop d7, so he's going to get this king to safety too. Now I say, well, what am I going to do with my bishop on c8? There's just uh, no future for it along the c1, I'm sorry, bishop on c1. c1 to h6 diagonal looks like a hopeless. Not going to go anywhere there. So uh, I play b3. Say maybe, maybe there's some future on the wing. Got to develop that piece. It seems like the best idea. So you pick your castles. I play bishop to b2. And he says, okay, now that you've committed your bishop on b2, I'll take that d pawn. Because now even though you play e takes d4, which is what you want to play, you that now you're saying maybe if I had my bishop back on c1, I could develop it along that line. But I can't now. I moved it to b2. So now's the right time to capture on d4. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm already thinking, okay, my pieces are not that happy. They're not working that well together. And you look at black's position, and there's no weaknesses, except for maybe d6 is a little weak. So black plays d6. Now it's not weak. Now it's also in the game. It's fighting for the e5 square. So he's got this d4, uh, he's e5 and d5 squares. e5 is under contestant. d5 is pretty much black square. And we're fighting for e4. So e4 and e5 are under contest. d4 is mine, d5 is his. Still pretty even game. But look at his position. His position has no weaknesses. His bishops are placed well. Knights are placed well. And is my bishop on b2 optimally placed? Probably. So I'm not that happy with how it's gone, but it's okay. Seems okay. Rook to e1. Here's a half open file. The rook belongs on it. Put it there. So he plays a6. Hmm. Why not? All the time in the world. It's not an open game. There's no reason not to place smart moves. Takes away the b5 square from my pieces. Threatens to move b5, maybe, if he wants to, in some later position. Uh, so he prepares it. So it's a fine move. There's no, there's no waste of time here. So I play c4, which is a little committal. Because I now want that knight on d2 to be on c3. But wishing it so doesn't make it so. It's on d2. Ideally, it would be on c3. Then my game would be fine. But now it's, it's a little bit awkward. It's not ideally placed. No, that's okay, though. You know, I'm still fighting for the squares. But, you know, I don't really have a weakness either. So I'm not that un unhappy. Knight on B to D7, completing his development. Typical. Very good. I play H3 here, and H3 is not pertinent. It's not really, but um, I want to give my king some luft. I'm not sure what to do. And so I'm just, uh, I had a friend, Steve Brandwine, who used to, in this kind of position, he used to say pass. Huh. It, doesn't, it doesn't hurt my position. It gives my king some luft. There's really no point to it. It's not like I'm going to move my bishop to e3 and I want to prevent knight g4. Uh, but I, I played it. Uh, he plays rook e8. Very smart. You know, the rook belongs on e8. Why not move it there? Now, I play rook e3, and this is, again, maybe this is what I was thinking when I played h3. This is, this is not a pertinent move. This is not a good move. Uh, it's not a terrible move. It's not a blunder by any mistake, but it's uh, by any any sense of the word. But it's not got a point to it. This is what you're trying to make your moves meaningful, have a point. 
And so he says, okay, Bishop F8, all right. I'll put my rook, I'll make that rook on the E file too. What are you gonna do, play D5? You'd be dumb to do that, but he's ready if I if I do play it. So now I just am running out of ideas. And I guess I was thinking like Queen E2 and then Rook E1, uh, maybe tripling on a half open file that is no hope of me opening is is just not. So I must be double thinking here and saying, why did I do this? I don't know what to do. Uh, so I'll just trade pieces. Rook, uh, so I play knight to e4. Maybe just trade pieces. Well, this isn't too smart on my part because I just played rook to e3. I could have played knight to e4 without playing rook to e3. And it would have been the same position. Knight takes knight. Bishop takes. Bishop takes. Rook takes. So this is the coward's way to play chess, to trade pieces, and hope you get down to a drawn ending. Uh, but Victor has something up his sleeve that I didn't take into account. And again, I could have gone into this with that. The rook e3 was just a complete waste of move. h3 and rook e3, complete waste of time. Just allowed him to play his bishop to f8 and activate his rook along the e-file. So now he plays d5. Ouch. Well, it's OK, I guess, as long as I you know, don't leave myself on an isolated pawn. Uh, but C takes and then E takes would be fine for me. But he plays knight f6. He doesn't play C takes. Uh, e takes. It's not embarrassing me, saying, uh-oh. Now I'm definitely embarrassed. I'm like, oh, boy. This is not the position I had in mind. So I have to play the rook retreat. Rook e2 is probably the best square for it. It's fine. Now knight takes d5. He doesn't have to play e takes d5. If he plays e takes d5, it's pretty drawish. And uh, then I would be cowardly happy. And um, But knight takes d5. Now that knight is clearly superior to my bishop on b2. The pawn is, on d4 is isolated. All endings are superior for black, no matter what endings they are. So I'm not a happy camper, but rook c1, hey, there's an open file. Put your rooks on it. That makes sense to me. Plays bishop to d6. Now, is he going to play e5? I don't think so. But, he, you know, it's activating the bishop. It's activating the piece. It's, like, really a smart move. Good idea. Uh, get the queen, connect the rooks. You know, he's going to complete his development. And any ending is going to be better for black. So he knows it. I know it. And uh, take his time. So I play knight to e5. And I think, ah, OK. At least I'll put a little squeeze on his position. Because um, he's not going to take that knight. I know it. And he does. All right, so this is what separates the international masters from the FIDE masters. You know, I asked him about it. I said, you know, I really didn't expect you to take that knight. And he said, you know, it's the same. The ending's the same. Because now I don't have a, an isolated pawn. And so I'm thinking he's improved my position. And he says, no, it's just the same. The knight is better than the bishop. Oh, OK. I see what you mean. So I take back. He plays queen g5. Now that his rooks are connected, he can play to the d file. But look at that knight. I've got no pawns that can drive it away. It's in the center. It's it's supported by a pawn on e6. It's super solid. The bishop can't hop over that pawn on e5, so it can't get into a kingside attack. It's got no future, really. So. Also, I point out there's still rooks on the board, so it's not quite as important. But knights and queens are much better. They work much better together than queens and bishops do. So if you're going to have a choice between minor piece and a queen, choose the knight and queen. Interesting. Not the queen and bishop. The reason is that it's the only move that, that the queen cannot emulate, the only piece is powers that the queen does not possess, is the knights. And the knight adds something to the queen's power that the bishop cannot. The bishop just duplicates the 
power that the queen already possesses. But look at the threat of knight to f4 right now. Oh my goodness. Tax of the rook on e2 threatens mate on g2, threatens knight takes h3 check. So queen g5 has got a series of threats that I just don't want to think about. Ouch. So I played rookie four here. Now, it doesn't technically solve all the problems a knight f4 would create, but it it solves enough. It takes the the rook out of the the, the way, and a move like knight f4 now could be met by queen either g4 or f3. And I'm threatening to take that knight, and the knight has no nothing to do because can't might have to retreat. So rook e4 indirectly prevents knight f4 because knight f4 has no teeth anymore. So it's a good defensive move, and he says, "Okay, fine, but I'll play rook a c8." And I still got knight f4 in the air if you do anything stupid. So I play rook e to c4. And he takes it. And I take it. And he plays b5. Now, this is, a, this is really a smart move in a sense and a mistake in another. Because we've established that the queen knight is stronger than the queen of bishop. We've established that the knight is a superior minor piece. But if I can get exchange queens, I can draw this end. This is not a problem. The knight is not so much bit better than the bishop. Because there's only couple open files and I'm on one of them I have plenty of drawing chances this is really I'm not worried about this ending if I can trade Queens and what did b5 give me the opportunity to give me the opportunity to trade Queens Queen c1 now Victor knows this as well as I do he does not want to trade Queens what's he gonna do if he trades queens, he's really saying, I can't win. I'm going to play for a draw. It's going to be a drawn game, drawn ending. And he says, OK, I can't allow to draw this FIDE master. I'm an international master. I'm rated 300 points higher than he is. So I'll keep playing. I'll keep the queens on board. Queen f5. Oops, queen f5 is a blunder. You can see the positions. So I won't ask you why is it a blunder. It's a blunder because he overlooked rook c8. Now, this is really a tragedy because black had outplayed white the entire game. Not by a lot, but by enough to enter a position where you can win any ending that we choose uh, just about. He's got an advantage in any ending. Anyways. And it was almost there. He's almost there. But uh, I was going to trade queens and get to a drawable ending. Coward that I am. I was just trying to get a draw. But now it's too late. He's made a mistake. I'm going to win. So how did, he can't play rook takes rook because queen takes c8 is mate. No. Knight c7 doesn't work. Queen takes. It's fine. So how does he defend that rook? The only way to defend the rook, really. Rook f8. Guess why that doesn't work? Queen c5. And he has to resign. Again, this is a tr tragedy. And only because, you know, he was really outplaying me the whole game. And then just because he tried too hard to win, he lost. Now, how many times has that happened to me? I can't tell you, but it happens a lot. So 
How are we doing on time, Chris? Um, that well, we're we're doing great. Um, we have a little bit of time left um, to uh, talk about the Eid Foundation a little bit more, and uh, I just um, I, I really enjoyed uh, both both of your games. Your entire presentation today was just awesome. I learned so much, and I know all of our uh, players who are in the uh, chess camp have learned a lot as well um, reminder to the players in the chess camp in a few minutes you're going to go back to dailychessmusings.com click on the summer chess camp link click on the june chess camp and the monday assignments and you'll see what is in store next and then one more quick reminder before we uh, um, talk a little bit more about the Eid Foundation. Um, one more quick reminder, and that is um, make sure you join the chess tournament on chess.com for the noon um, tournament. And remember, the games start as soon as the previous game finishes. It is three rounds. So once you're there, just enjoy the tournament experience. Don't go do anything else. Because um, your round will start when the other games finish. Um, and then 2 p.m., um, uh, we will see you guys on the Chess by Lauren YouTube channel um, to, finish out, to finish out the day. Um, Jim, this has been a real pleasure. Again, I really enjoyed the entire presentation today. Um, and it, it was neat. It was neat um, featuring your games because, as you said, normally uh, we're, we're looking at, uh, you know, famous games from transitional times in uh, chess history. And uh, th this was this was really, really neat. I, I, I just really, really enjoyed it and learned a lot. Um, before before we finish up, what can you uh, uh, tell us about the uh, Eid Foundation? Yeah, um, thanks, Chris. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to to reach all the people in your summer camp. Um, you know, one thing I will say about that is I played board one in 1999 uh, Amateur Team East, and I went undefeated. I beat an IM Victor Frias, as we just saw, and drew Joel Benjamin, a multiple US champ, time US champion. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, on board one, I was playing a series of good players, and I was able to uh, avoid losing any games and uh, overachieved in a couple. Um, and it's the kind of tournament that you just never forget. And so whenever you think about uh, having a tournament that um, didn't go your way, hang in there because uh, you never know when you're going to be having a tournament that you'll never forget. It's one of the beauties of chess. You know, we set the pieces back up when or lose. And it doesn't matter um, if you win or lose, it's how you play the game. It just teaches us so much about how to play the game, which is why the Eid Foundation does what it does, which is help communities uh, develop uh, or help people develop a chess community, even if they can't afford chess equipment. If they live in a country that they can't join, they don't have access online, they don't have computers, they don't have internet access. They don't even have enough money uh, to to get make sure that they have meals every day, and uh, they're just living uh, life as best they can. You give them the gift of chess, especially to kids. It's wonderful for them because you know there's a lot of hours. Even if you get the meal of the day, there's still a lot of hours that you don't know what to do with. And if you're playing chess, you're not thinking about your ne where is your next meal coming from. You're not worrying about anything other than the position in front of you. And uh, one of the people in, in Uganda that I work with told me that when they start, he works with a lot of orphan children in Uganda, and he says, when they start playing chess, they stop crying. And it's just so wow to hear this, is that they don't have a lot, and chess gives them so much, gives them hope. And it gives them the sense that they have some way of expressing themselves that can be seen and appreciated by others. And so this is the gift we give to them 
And to help the Eid Foundation do this, just go to our website, eFoundation.org, and click on the donate button. No contribution is unappreciated, whether it's small or large. Um, and it's just what we do to help those uh, help themselves. Because once you get a community established, then people are starting to work together, teaching others to play. And everybody becomes a teacher, not just a student. Um, so all your students today, they're learning at your summer camps. You know, one day they'll be returning the favor to somebody else for teaching them the game of chess. It's a game. It's a gift that lasts a lifetime. It, it truly is. There's a, a famous uh, um, saying that uh, says that uh, when a, a candle lights another candle, it doesn't diminish itself at all. Um, everybody who's in this uh, camp today, everybody who uh, whoever learns chess uh, tends to return that favor and light somebody else's candle. And you can help light a lot of candles by uh, by uh, doing a, a quick donation to the uh, to the Eid Foundation. And how do they do that donation, uh, Jim? Uh, let me change it it's instead of uh, showing your banner, uh, mm -hmm. show mine. So go to the eatfoundation.org and there'll be you'll see a donate button there and just click on that and you'll be you'll walk through the donation amount. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And this is a uh, this is a free chess camp. So if you uh, if you appreciate um, this kind of experience and you feel like you want to give a, a small donation as a uh, thank you, uh, that's exactly how you do it. Go to and the also if you, if you don't if you don't have um, you don't feel like making a donation. If you just go to the YouTube channel, do a search and find the Eid Foundation channel and just subscribe. That'll help me um, because uh, then I can tell more people that uh, I have followers and that helps me when I try to get someone's attention to help others play chess, to hold a chess tournament. Uh, it just is a big help to me. Even yeah. if make sure, yeah, make sure you like and subscribe to this video. Um, again, this was a, a, a wonderful, wonderful lesson. Um, in fact, uh, it's worth watching um, later on, you know. Um, watch it again. You'll gain so much more. Um, you know, there, there are so many uh, little bits of wisdom that uh, Jim mentions when he's explaining why he did certain things. And you're, you're um, really seeing it from his perspective because these were games that he played so he remembers what he was thinking at the time there's no guesswork as to uh his decision making process um and he's a very very strong chess player and so it's it's a real treat to get that kind of glimpse into how his mind works on these uh on these positions jim we gotta run okay um, but uh, th thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much. It was it was just a real pleasure. All right. So I'll sign off now, Chris. Okay. And, uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your camp, everyone. We certainly will. Bye bye.